Okay, this video is going to be an introduction to Hornet's. I've wanted to do this for a while, but I never got around to it, so now is probably a good time. And where are we going to start? Let's start fresh. You can get Hornet's from Hornet's.net. You can see here that the author is David McBean. The uh, current version is 39.7. And you can also see that uh, David McBean is open to communication. He's got an email address somewhere, probably by clicking on his name. And also, if you go to DIYAudio.com in the subwoofers forum, he's got a thread there as well. And as you can see, it's usually right on the first page, and right now it's right at the top. This thread has been ongoing for quite a while. It's usually active every day. You can see it started in March 2008, and that was way back when it was at version 18. So there's been a lot of updates. David uh, updates this program very regularly. He fixes bugs all the time as soon as they pop up. And uh, if there's any new features that you want, he's very open to that. So you can contact him either through email or through this thread here. And it's probably better if you do it through the thread because then everyone can see what's going on. So let's go and download this. It's a very small file and it downloads very quickly. Now Hornresp has been around probably for about 40 years. Probably hasn't been available to the public for all that time, but David started this way back when computers were using punch cards for inputs and outputs. So it's a very, very old program at this point, and we're just going to install it. I usually put it right on the desktop because I use it all the time. And there it is. Now what I usually do is put all the files, you get four when you first download it, I put them all in a folder, and then everything's together. You can see I already have one rest here, but I want to start from the beginning for this. Now we start one rest. and it creates a few more files, an import file, export file, and a few other things. Um, now the first thing that you probably want to do is read the instructions. They're very incredibly important and nobody ever reads them. But they're quite comprehensive. He goes through just about everything and we're not going to do that right now. Now, when you first start Hornrasp, this is the screen that you get. It's the default, and you can run through and look what he's actually done here. We're not going to mask anything. So it's a horn, the default record. And we're not too worried about that right now. So this is the input screen, and we're going to go over all of the inputs. So, the first thing that you need to do, because you cannot edit the default record at all, is add a new record. Now we're at record 2, and we could name this something else. And we'll do a sealed box for now. Up here, we have the radiation angle. If you double click on the box, you can see that it's set at default for corner loading. This is three boundaries. It's assumed that these boundaries are infinite and that the speaker is flush mounted at the junction of those boundaries. Now, if you're not flush mounted at the junction of those boundaries, then you are going to get an idealized calculation. Now, if we look at a different program here for a second, this is Jeff Bagby's diffraction and boundary simulator, and the top part can sim diffraction. Hornrasp isn't really concerned about diffraction because it doesn't know how big the front face of the speaker is and there's no way for you to tell it. 
and you can see the diffraction is pretty important. This is just the diffraction pro profile of the front baffle. And if we make that infinitely large, then we can see that the diffraction profile is actually just a flat gain of 6 dB across the board. So diffraction doesn't really affect anything because the dimensions of the front face of the box are large compared to all of the wavelengths inside the passband. So even at 10 Hertz this baffle is much larger than that wavelength. Now if we go down a little bit we can see the uh, the effect of adding walls. Now this is assuming that uh, these two are actually turned off with a large value so these boundaries are not in effect at all because the distance is much larger than the wavelengths in the passband. What we're looking at right now is just a floor bounce from a speaker height of 32 inches off the floor and we can see that that does actually have an effect inside a subwoofer passband. So when we're looking at the horn rasp uh, angles it's assuming that you're flush mounted right into the wall and you get a flat gain throughout the whole passband. But if you're not flush mounting your speaker and it's say 12 inches in front of the wall then it might not have too much effect inside the passband but it's hard to get the front face of the speaker or the speaker and the port that close to the wall. More realistically you're going to be out about two feet and then you do have some kind of effects inside the passband and horn rasp isn't going to show that. Um, that's not what horn rasp is really for. It just shows the idealized um, gain when you add boundaries and it's assumed that you're flush mounted. And if we add more boundaries here we can really make a mess. But anyway, within the within a subwoofer's passband, there's going to be a little bit of effect if you're out from the wall a little bit. The horn rasp won't show, but it's not going to be a huge effect. So we don't need that anymore. And usually, um, so this is corner loading. This is floor and wall loading. The one pi, and again, it's assumed that you're flush inside the junction there that the baffle face is flush with with the uh, the face of the walls and this is like you're in an open parking lot with no boundaries anywhere nearby and this is how things are usually measured if you want to measure something without any influence of uh, room modes, room gain, uh, reflections cancellations, all, all kinds of stuff like that, then you would want to measure outside. So this is how stuff is usually measured and this is how stuff is usually simulated. Most of the simulators are going to default to 2pi and in most of the simulators you can't change that. So we're going to simulate everything in 2pi today. Now 4pi is like you're uh, up in the air. Like if you attach the speaker to a balloon and flew it way above. Um, now this assumes that uh, the long, the height above the ground is longer than the longest wavelength in the passband. And sometimes you're going to have a situation where your passband is partially two pi and partially four pi. But we're not going to worry about that too much. If you want to worry about stuff like that, then you can go to stuff like Bagby's Diffraction and uh, Boundary Simulator. So we're going to set it at 2pi because that's how stuff is usually simulated and usually measured as long as you're measuring inside. 
Now, EG is your power, and it wants volts. And just to stop for a minute here, any of these boxes, if you hover your mouse on them, it will tell you down here exactly what the box is, and maybe even give you a hint about what's put in the box. So, here we have EG, it's the, um, the amplifier voltage. If you know your amplifier voltage rails, um, and you're going to be limited by power and not excursion, then you can just put your amplifier voltage right in here. Most people don't know, and in a lot of cases you're not going to be limited by power anyway, you're going to be limited by excursion. So, um, what we do here is we just double click and you get a wizard, and it's going to let us input power and watts, and it will automatically convert it into uh, voltage, which is pretty useful because then you don't have to worry about amps and formulas and all kinds of stuff like that. So just to start out, we're going to put in 100 watts and leave it at 8 ohms because we don't actually have a speaker that we're working with yet. Okay, RG, um, this is a uh, series resistance. That would be any extra resistance added by your amplifier or your speaker cables. And if you want to put anything in there at all, uh, it would be a very low value, just the uh, resistance of your speaker wires usually. So a very low value. We're just going to leave that alone for now. Now this, we're not going to worry about that at all. Um, all of these things that are in gray, these are actually uh, stuff that's calculated by Hornrasp, and for the most part, most people are not going to have to worry about those. Uh, you can uh, hover your mouse over these things and find out what they are, and uh, at this point, we're just doing a sealed box, so none of this matters anyway. Now, all of these boxes, the S1 to the S4, these are all for a more complex um, enclosure uh, dimensions that a sealed box isn't really going to need to worry about. And these are all assuming that it's not a sealed box, there's actually a port or terminus at the end anyway. So, we're going to get rid of all of them. You don't have to delete each box individually. If you just go to the first one, um, select the box, backspace, and click on something else, then everything disappears. Now, this stuff down here, this is where we put in the driver TS parameters. And uh, we'll get to this last box after. So, uh, we're going to use this driver here, the Dayton RSS 12 inch. And again, hover over the box and it'll tell you what it wants. Most of these things are available right off any data sheet. Some of them aren't. Now, MMS, MMD, Usually the uh, driver sheet is going to show you MMS, which is a little bit different than MMD. So some things you're not going to have, and most driver sheets don't have RMS at all. So the way I like to do it is uh, we can pick some things right off the driver sheet, like SD. we got 507.1. and then CMS. We could take it right off the sheet here, but I prefer not to do it that way. What I prefer to do is double click the box and then it gives you a wizard to help you. And we're sure that this is right because we just put it right in there. And now it's going to ask for this. And we find this right here at 61.3 liters. So we transfer that. OK, and it calculates the CMS for us. Now for the MMD, double click it again and we get the wizard. We know that those two things are right because we put them in. And we have to enter FS, which is 21.5. OK, 
okay and it calculates that now for re we don't need a wizard that's right there 6.5 Moving on to BL, we could get it off the spec sheet, but I'm not going to do that. Double click it. Click yes, because everything it asked for we already entered. It wants to confirm that FS is 21.5. Yes, it is. And now it wants QES, and that is 0.41. Easy stuff. RMS, double click. Yes, we're sure that CMS is right because we entered it. Yes, FS is right because we entered it. And it wants QMS. So we give it 3.7. LE, right off the spec sheet. We don't need a wizard for that. Where is it? There it is. 3.17. And that's all the driver TS parameters. Now, ND is number of drivers. And actually, it could stand for end loaded too, because if you click it, you get a number of different things like offset driver, tap torn. Tap torn one is a different tap torn configuration. Uh, compound horn. And this will just be end loaded. And originally, it stood for number of drivers. So if you double click this, you can add any amount of drivers that you want in series or parallel, and you can even make them isobaric loaded, so there's two times in each one of these. There's not much need for isobaric loading with the drivers in today's marketplace, so we are going to not use that and we only need one driver for this sim anyway so we'll just cancel that and leave that one now this will also tell you down here it will calculate the uh, amplifier load if you have more than one driver so it calculates the uh, resistance for you which is pretty useful so we're just going to leave it at one and now this is the uh, port information here, the area of the port and the length of the port. We don't have a port in the sealed box, so we're going to get rid of those. This is the volume of the throat chamber and the area of the throat chamber, and we don't have any of those in a sealed box either. We'll get to this stuff later. This is the volume of the rear chamber and the length of the rear chamber. So, for the volume of the rear chamber, if you don't know what to put in there, you might as well just start with a sealed box that is equal to the volume of air that is equal to the uh, suspension. So we'll go with uh, 61.3 liters for now just to see what that does for us and we'll make the box let's say 33 centimeters deep and we'll calculate that and see what it gets us now um, since we just chose 33 centimeters deep randomly we are going to mask the enclosure resonances because if you change it the uh, depth it'll change the shape of the box and it'll change the resonances and we're not too worried about the resonances right now, so we're going to mask that. And what we have here is a box that, uh, when you hit calculate, you get the schematic diagram. If you hover in here, it'll tell you what the volume is of the segment that you're on. This segment is 61.3 liters, and that's all there is to the box, so um, it equals the entire system volume. And we'll look at a few of the different graphs that Quantum Rest provides for us. The acoustical impedance, this shows uh, resistance versus reactance, I believe. And I've never met anyone yet that um, has any real use for this graph. So we're just going to completely ignore that for now. The acoustical power is just your uh, SPL level.
And what you got here is frequency from 10 hertz to 20,000 hertz versus SPL from 65 to 115. And we can see that a sealed box with this driver, 61.3 liters, we have an F3 somewhere around 40 hertz. Or maybe, yeah, somewhere around 45. So this isn't going to give you a whole lot of days. But sealed boxes don't. You can look at the electrical impedance and uh, sealed boxes have one single impedance peak and then naturally the impedance rises towards higher frequencies and that's going to be the same with any box type. You can scale this if you like. Zoom it in so you can get a little bit better picture of what's going on there. And we'll look at diaphragm displacement. Now we never actually set the power correctly here because we had it in reference to 8 ohms, which would be correct if you use the nominal impedance of the driver because it is a 6.5 ohm driver, so the nominal impedance would be 8 ohms, but I like to do it a little bit more accurately and do 100 watts at the actual RE. So put 6.5 watts in there, click OK and we'll recalculate that. And so the acoustical power is going to change a little bit because it's a different amount of power. The diaphragm displacement and at 100 watts, I think the X max on this was 14 millimeters. Yeah, 14 millimeters. So even at 10 hertz with 100 watts, we're not quite using up all the available excursion of the driver. And the driver will have a little bit of extra excursion that's available even past X max, but X max is your uh, your limit usually if you want it to sound okay. Um, above X max you're going to get a bunch of distortion. And moving on, we can look at phase and we can actually delay the phase if you wanted to. There's different things that you can do with that. It's a little bit advanced for a beginner tutorial. And we can look at group delay. So you can see that at the lower frequencies there's going to be a little bit of delay. Um, a little bit more than 9 seconds of delay. Uh, milliseconds of delay at 10 hertz. That's not really going to be all that audible, especially at a frequency that low. So what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to look at this in the loudspeaker wizard because that's a very cool tool. And again, we are going to mask the resonances for this. And the loudspeaker wizard will show us what the QT, QTC is. And QTC is equal to 5.3 or 0.53 with this size of box, which is pretty low. That's almost 0.5, which is critically damped. So that's a fairly large box size for this in terms of QTC. Now QTC doesn't really matter that much because if you have EQ, um, you can get whatever type of uh, frequency response curve shape that you want. And QTC is just describing the behavior of the low end roll off. And um, it does point to how much ringing there is as well, but usually it's not going to be audible ringing unless your QTC is really high. Now, in the loudspeaker wizard, um, we can change the volume of the box, look at the schematic, and we can make it bigger and bigger, and it's going to continue to make it skinnier because we have the, the 
depth of the rear chamber set at 33, so the bigger the length of the limb it's going to get. And now we're up to 400 liters, which is really large. And we can see what that did to the frequency response. Uh, we're showing the baseline right now. We could get rid of that, but it shows us the original response in the original 61.3 liter box. And we can see that the QTC is going down, which just means that you've got a shallower slope here. And from here, inside the wizard, we can also look at impedance. We can see that the impedance peak dropped down in frequency a little bit as we made the box larger. And we can also look at displacement. Displacement goes up because we didn't change the power and the box is larger. It takes a little bit more excursion. But in exchange for that extra excursion, we get a couple dB more at the low frequencies. Other things that you can change in here, um, we could add a port if we wanted to, but we're going to do that separately later. We can look at the driver TS parameters and we could change them if we wanted to. And then in other most of the stuff that's available here is also available in Wizard. And then there's memory. You can uh, use all this stuff. I don't use any of it, so I'm not going to explain any of that stuff. And for the output, a sealed box only has one output, and that's what it's showing. So if we try to show output 2, which would be the port output, which doesn't exist, it's not going to show us anything. And as well for combined, it won't show us anything because there's no port. So output one is the only one that matters, and it's the only one that will show you anything. So we're going to cancel that. We do not want to save the 400 liter sealed box results.